10 by 6, episode 7. Welcome, Tom. Woohoo! Hi, Jace. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Right, we're going to go straight into the show. None of this banter about the weather this week. Um, <laughs> NHS data. Um, thankfully, um, in the last couple of days, the government have postponed the um, opt out from NHS data, um, which they put forward all these different ideas on the, on the government website using civil servants, it has to be said, to persuade people to allow their GPs and the NHS more generally to share their data. Where it's going to be shared to, of course, is rather nebulous. Um, they, they probably would argue it's not nebulous, but you know, the fact that when you look on their website, it does certainly appear to be um, an obfuscation, should we say. It's, 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 over, it's, it's generalized terms that they've, like, for example, like um, research, planning, um, the intention of using the data to help us to avoid another epidemic, but they're, they're not specific at all what that means and for many people there's a sort of a suspicion that actually this data will be sold by the uk government so our data will be sold by a tory government to american insurance companies who will then use that data to contract people individually to develop policy structures in the future along along lines of a, a privatized health service in this country that will not be beneficial to the most people in this country, as we can see from the United States. The United States obviously is a classic example, isn't it, Tom, of how so many people, tens and tens of millions of people, are left out pretty much from receiving even adequate health care. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a massive concern, a massive concern. And just... For the viewers, for, for those that don't know, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows how horrendous the, the American system is, but uh, the, the average cost of health insurance per person in the United States is around the $5,000 mark, so four, roughly £4,000. Family of four, £16,000 per year for health insurance cover that often doesn't cover everything, uh, that often uh, that still includes payments to be made by you, uh, it doesn't cover all the costs, there's still co-payments and deductibles and um, and various illnesses that suddenly people fall ill and find that that, that particular illness is not part of the cover. Um, and, uh, you know, the number one cause of, of bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy in America is, med is due to medical bills. Uh, really shocking. I forget the figures, but I think it was, you know, I think millions of people now have, have gone bankrupt in America due to unpaid medical bills over the last, say, 10 years. And of um, course, and of course, they are the, the middle classes, aren't they? They're the middle classes who can actually afford it. There's 40 to 50 million people in America who can't even afford that insurance. And when we people study life expectancy in the United States, it's no surprise that the people who can't afford insurance are dying a lot earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It's despicable, and uh, I mean, it's. I'm sure another time we'll talk about why America is now a, a, a pretty much a failed society in any sort of measure of, of, of society, but but certainly lack of access to healthcare, uh, you know, massive wealth inequality, and the lack of access, to, you know, associated lack of access to to healthcare is certainly one of the the the, the major indicators of a society that's just not working. And there's some frightening videos on YouTube that show private ambulances dumping patients outside of hospitals. They take it, they, take, they basically, they arrive at a hospital, they're asked if they've got insurance, they haven't got the insurance. So what they tend to do then is, this is often people, for example, who are living on the streets, they then take them in a private ambulance and take them to a hospital that is much more, let's say, sympathetic to dealing with um, non-insurance based patients. And just dumping them outside and driving off. Yeah. So, and you've got these CCTV cameras, obviously shown, the recording shown on YouTube of these people sometimes who don't know where they are. They're wandering around aimlessly in a nightgown uh, outside the hospital, and until then, people come out and, and take them inside. This is mm -hmm. supposed to be, you know, 
one of the most civilized places in, in, on the on the planet, and yet it's it's far from civilized in terms of what so many bureaucrats um, and, and, and corporate profiteers are actually doing. It's it's shocking and it's brutal uh, and it's deadly the the system. And for those that have seen, you know, there's been various extraordinary, fabulous documentaries about, uh, uh, you know, showing showing that how appalling the system is in America and. Um, you know, John Pilger's documentary made a couple of two, three years ago yes. um, showed extraordinary scenes. You know, this charity that, that that runs whole days or several days at a time, where people without insurance can can go and for free get medical and dental uh, attention and treatment. And there's people camping for days in a queue to, to you know to access that. Um, you know, huge, huge numbers of poor people that just can't afford medical cover and, and, and don't get treatment. And they have to queue up for days to get this charity health care, if they're lucky, um, and travel, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles to, to access it. So, yeah, yeah, really eye opening and shocking. And uh, don't for a minute think that, that, you know, that that isn't the, the aim. Some people think, well, that's America, you know, and oh, and by the way, the American system costs two and a half times per person per capita. It's two and a half times more expensive overall than any other um, system in any sort of developed country. So massively expensive. And the reason it's massively expensive is there are vast, vast profits, of course, going to the, the uh, insurance companies and, and their rich shareholders. And and big farmer and their shareholders, etc. Um, of course, but don't the other really way... think that, that that can't happen here because uh, it's very clear that selling off whole swathes of our, our NHS to um, you know to private interest, particularly from America, is very much uh, central to the government's agenda. But the other major reason, Tom, I think even well, certainly just as substantial, is the fact that whenever insurance companies are involved as we've seen for example with motor vehicles is that the actual amount that the customer is charged if they're claiming from the insurance is considerably more than it would be if it wasn't because with insurance companies or you know is this on insurance you know wherever it might be oh they stick another hundred quid on top so that's <laughs> yeah, why it's, zero. exactly that's why it's so inefficient because it's costing so much more because people take advantage of the fact that it's an insurance based scheme. Yeah. But coming back to the data, um, you know, please, please um, viewers, do your own research, go onto the government website, and if you believe them, fine. But if you don't believe them, you can contact your GP by clicking on, you know, click on the link, you can contact your GP, they should be messaging you. I, I know, for example, that local people around here have received texts in the last few days from their surgeries, still based on the premise that the opt-out um, is in June. Of course, it now it's been suspended until the 1st of September. But contact your GP if you don't trust the government, if you don't trust them with what they're going to do with this data. And all you've got to do is just inform your GP that you don't want your data shared. And that way, these private companies in the future will not get their hands on your data and be able to exploit you and it behind your back. And it's, it's worth adding that there are there is a form. There's actually two forms. There's one for your GP, and there's one that if yes. if you're online, you can go on NHS uh, di digital website and opt out. And and there's a need to do both if you want to opt out. I, my understanding at the moment is that you should do both. Yes. because they're two separate entities uh, act you know so fill in a form hand it into your gp practice um and by by the date in september now and also go on the nhs digital site and and opt out on there and uh you, people can find links from the article there on on dorset i um and it's fascinating that you know the government's uh, the government have asserted that they are not going to sell our uh gp records uh, however, they do say that uh, they may be, um, there may be a transaction where our GP records are given to private companies, which obviously will mostly be American uh, healthcare companies, um, 
and and as part of that transaction, there may be money flowing in the other direction. <laughs> so uh, they go, no, we're not selling it. No, we're just giving it away, and and we might get some money uh, back for it to the Conservative Party. Of course, you know, I mean, they don't have to directly sell it. Um, they can give it away, and 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 in return, that you know, they can simultaneously give vast contracts using our public money Good to the prayer. private companies as they have been doing throughout the pandemic. And those private companies may have links to the Conservative Party. They may donate large sums of money back to the Conservative Party or to individuals such as Boris Johnson. So, you know, it's a roundabout of corruption and the words they use to hide that are, um, you know, to, to be uh, scoffed at by anyone with, with any sanity. No, um, and, and, and again, our advice is to, you know, to viewers, do your own research, find out for yourselves, but if you decide that you don't trust the government, don't wait to the 1st of December. You've got now the rest of June, July and August to fill out these forms. Just, you know, even if it takes, takes a couple of minutes to do so, um, protect yourself. Yeah. And we are, we are talking here about, you know, all our records. So your whole medical history, uh, your illnesses, your medications, your sexuality, your sexual history, your mental health history, all of that for your whole family um, is what we're talking about being yeah. being uh, given to private companies. And of course, one of the reasons why that information is so valuable is that if we consider that we may be moving towards an American privatized model with health insurance um, in the future, uh, which of course the Conservatives deny, but um, but but I think that's very likely to be what they're the, the direction that they're heading. All the evidence suggests that's the direction they're heading. Um, that information is really valuable, particularly to health insurance companies, because they will base decisions on, on your medical history. That's what they use to base their decisions about how much premiums they're going to charge you. So if you're unbelievably healthy and have hardly ever suffered with any illness in your life, your premiums will be cheaper. If you've had a, a number of illnesses or even a, perhaps a, a permanent illness or, or sort of disability that requires medical treatment, uh, your premiums will, of course, be astronomical, and they use that information to, to determine those premiums. And, of course, a couple of things to finish off this slot. But firstly, again, readers, uh, viewers, do some research in terms of the number of GP surgeries that are being handed over to American insurance companies already. Um, that is a, a massive issue. But of course, also is the development of the, the DNA trackers. So if they're doing a lot of, you know, information will be coming from our DNA in future as they progress scientifically, they'll be able to tell what we're susceptible in terms of hereditary illnesses too. And that also will det determine the premium that we're going to be charged from a very early age. You know, we won't have any control over it. They'll just say, oh, we've looked for your DNA. You know, we can trace it back two or three generations and we find that there's a history of heart disease. Um, unfortunately, that's going to mean that your premium's pushed up by X number of pounds. And there's nothing we can do about it. And that's what's happening, you know, or will happen, you know, across the world where we allow private healthcare to take over. So again, you know, like many other topics, I'm sure we'll be back on this one soon, Tom. Um, and, and just finally on that, that, that that's where the, the concept, the socialist concept on which the NHS is, was founded um, is crucial there because it's the concept of pooling the risk rather than individuals mm, having absolutely. low risk or high risk and paying, uh, paying associated premiums or not being able to afford health care at all. The idea with the NHS is that the risk is pooled. Some people are low risk, some people are high risk. Some people require lots of hospital treatment and medication. Others require very little. And the idea is that, you know, <laughs> that, that that risk is, is pooled and we all look after each other and Absolutely. everyone's equal and everyone gets, um, you know, treatment free at the point of delivery through our NHS. Something we have to fight for to hold, to, to hold on to. Yep. And Nye Bevan, I can see on my T-shirt, you know, he was there at the beginning. OK, moving on to the um, second topic this week. Um, which is a, a local issue in relation to our, our local media, um, the Dorset Echo, and an article which we're not going to show, so our readers can 
can go onto the Dorset Echo website themselves and find out for themselves. But it's an article that they put up about gypsy travellers. Um, and ultimately, the, the concern, I think, locally for a lot of people was the stereotypes, the way in which they, they took individual behaviours and they lumped them all together. And you do tend to find the stereotypes are often used by the media, especially the corporate media, in order to not so much dumb down, just to make it much easier for their readers to understand. Because unless the readers have had an education that allows them to understand many of the different factors and the faculties of, of, of a society, and they've studied it to a considerable degree, the, the media believes that it needs to use simple language that's appealing to you know, simpler people with a, a lot lower education outcomes and stereotypes become the norm. So this is very much the crux of this particular issue and the problem, but I'm not gonna focus on, or I don't want us to focus on a, a critique of the Dorse Echo. I just want to allow us to look at how thankfully, and this is just a, a small portion, so many people have responded um, and as we can see here, some of the many critical responses, you know, way to go, Dorset Echo, spreading the hate as if there wasn't enough prejudice around here already, which in itself says so much about Dorset. It says so much about, you know, the, the readership, if you like, of, of the Dorset Echo in some respects. Some good old fashioned racism from the Dorset Echo, is it? Important to remember that where intolerance can lead. There is bad behaviour in all groups, loads of litter uh, left by tourists on Dorset beaches, but also by locals. Tackle the behaviour, not some group of people who will, like us all, be a mix of characters. That is a brilliant response. Don't label the individual. Don't stereotype us all into a group. Just focus on the behaviour, because many individuals have extremely positive attributes. The fact is that when they behave in a certain way, once we attach that label, all those positive attributes dissipate. They disappear from people's consciousness. But if you focus on the individual behavior, we can work with that behavior and we can change it, which is obviously a lot more challenging if we're focusing upon the holistic individual with all, with all their individual complexities. What a pathetic racist little article. They felt threatened by being asked for water. This refers to the, the people who came forward in the article and said, oh, they probably doubt they're going to come back to Weymouth or back to the area again because of their experiences with gypsy travellers. Hold a pitch where the caravan club have been setting up camp for years. Replace that with traveller pitch, where travellers have turned up for years and you might have a solution. And this, just finishing off, more unwarranted hatred towards families that struggle because of ignorance and privilege being manipulated by right-wing media spreading hate. And this is somebody local who's written this. You know, these discriminated people are living a traditional way of life. The earth was not made to be owned by privileged and greedy. Land stolen by church and state a long time ago and passed down through the inheritance. Still, life gets harder as Pretty Patel brings in laws to make anyone travelling a criminal. Respect breeds respect. Hatred does not bring anything good. The history of Roma and Irish travellers is full of it. Stop the hate and ignorance and divide sites rather than selling off public land to private interests, councils are serving themselves. So in itself, you know, that was really where I want us to focus. It's not again on this, oh, you know, here's something in the media and how vile it is and how short-sighted it is, etc. But it's the response of the public that's what makes you feel so, so you know, good and you know, enlightened by the fact that you know we're not on our own. We are. There's lots and lots of lovely, great people out there. Well, that was great to see, Jason. Yeah, and um, you know, a good article that you put together. You know, highlighting those really good quotes from from people, and it was nice to see. Often on social media, particularly Facebook, on local groups, uh, we see quite a lot of ra racism and. Uh, uh, prejudice and uh, that that happens very often but um, uh, on this occasion on the, the those were mostly taken I think from the Facebook page of the Dorset Echo site uh, local people 
you know, really, really challenged the Echo about their the nature of their articles they're reporting. I think that was the third article of that type within the space of a couple of days. And uh, and it was great to see local people standing up for, for decent values. Um, and uh, and traveler traveler um, sort of history. Um, it's worth mentioning to our, our listeners this this month is Gypsy Roma and Traveler History Month. Um, and in fact, uh, in terms of a local event on the twenty Saturday the twenty sixth of June, there's an event at the Borough Gardens in Dorchester in the afternoon, weather and COVID permitting. Uh, but I, at the moment, it's due to go ahead. From 12 o'clock, from 12 noon till 4 p.m., Saturday, 26th of June, uh, and it's an event uh, organised around Roma and Traveller. Uh, the it's organised by the Roma and Traveller Family History Society. Um, Fantastic. And that that will be a very interesting event to uh, to go along to. So um, yeah, and of course. Uh, you know, like somebody referred to in that, I think that last um, quote, uh, land isn't, wasn't, <laughs> you know, it's a political viewpoint, but uh, this land is our land, it wasn't meant to be stolen by the rich and privileged, and uh, often violently, uh, or sometimes with their ill-gotten gains through things like slavery, uh, and uh, kept to themselves, and uh, and the Enclosure Act, and things that that stopped yes. ordinary people from accessing the land. It was just stolen by the rich and privileged, and they've held on to it ever since. Um, a, a great friend of mine, Tom, tells a little story that um, you know, a, a, an an average person goes up to a privileged, wealthy landowner uh, who owns vast swathes of land, and says, "How how can we get all this land?" And the rich person says, well, it was given to me by, you know, I inherited it from my, my parents. Right, how did they get it? Well, they got it from their parents. How did they get it? Well, they, they inherited it from their parents. How did they get it? They inherited it from their parents. How did they get it? Well, well they, they fought for it. And the, the average person goes, all oh, right, okay, come on then. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. That's Fair a joke from my friend Tom. Uh, that's great stuff. That's a brilliant place to finish. Yeah. So I mean, hopefully, if my diary's free, we'll be up there uh, on the 26th of June in the Borough Gardens in Dorchester. Um, fabulous event. Excellent. Thank you. Next, uh, next article we're looking at, or the next content we're looking at, is an, an interview I did a couple of days ago with Paul Farmer from Cornwall. He's an author, uh, a lecturer um, at Farmer College. And he wrote an article for us last week, which we published um, about the build up to the G7 in Cornwall. Um, and his, his focus isn't though on, in this particular interview, isn't on the environmental targets in any way. It's about what he called the paramilitary build up and how his area of Cornwall um, has been sectioned off. Um, and it's, it's, it's an excellent interview and it, it brings forth some, again, some extremely concerning and worrying ways in which the, the police force are given carte blanche whenever there's a, a big event of this type um, to behave in ways in which you'd never expect a democratic society to behave. Um, and again, certain institutions within society are given priority over the local people. So here's our interview, or the interview I did with Paul Farmer a couple of days ago. Hi, Paul Farmer, welcome to 10 by 6. Hello. We've introduced, uh, we've introduced and asked Paul onto the, the programme this week, um, and he's coming on again next week. So we're going to be talking about two separate things. This week, we're going to talk about the G7. Um, not specifically the environmental targets and things like that, but just the way in which his area of Cornwall is being affected by the build-up um, to G7 conference, which takes place this weekend. And our focus will be primarily upon the police, but also we're touching upon housing um, and the media in the local area. And then, as I say, next week, we're going to talk to you again, Paul, about your book, which has been fantastic. So how are you? Okay. 
Yeah, very well, very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Work's easing off. <laughs> <laughs> well, this discussion is a alongside an, an article that Paul has written for Dorset Eye, uh, which we published earlier in the week. Um, and this article is entitled, as you can see, the paramilitary have arrived in Cornwall. So it's, it goes straight to the core of the matter. And it's an excellent article, only a short article, so it doesn't take long to read, but it's an excellent article going right to the heart of Paul and the local people's experiences that are taking place in and around him and have been since what? Since when, Paul? Since last week as this build up began? Yeah, yeah, it's been, yes, over the last, yeah, we, they've been talking about it for a while, but the actual build up has been going on, particularly over the last few days. Yes. And now we're circled by helicopters almost continuously. So tell us about your, you know, your, your, the article is, is just, as I say, it's, it's a great, great little article. So tell us about, you know, how you've come into contact with the police and your sort of experiences thus far. But it's um, the, the, the kind of the main way this has been introduced to us is through the kind of local media who um, who have been reporting on the police's um, the police's. Uh, preparations for g7 and we actually got given a uh, throughout through our door now now this is i'm in penryn at the moment which is nearly 30 miles from carbis bay but we get a book because falmouth has been shut off for reasons we'll talk about uh, the center of falmouth has been shut off for reasons we'll talk about um but uh, so the police uh, the police saying to us we are proud that cornwall has been chosen to host the g7 summit which is kind of appropriate because from the way it looks um, it looks like the police are actually hosting the G7 summit and not Cornwall at all. Um, we, we have the media telling us uh, about rings of steel, which been, have been erected around um, um, the erected being very, most appropriate because this is a very macho picture we're getting here of, uh, of, of the policing. But they've, uh, they've erected a ring of steel around Carbis Bay, the Carbis Bay Hotel and uh, large parts of St Ives um, where the people are staying. And, um, and overall, the entire emphasis is on this security. And so the media is full of uh, pictures of uh, police with uh, heavily armed police, because we've got a graphic here, um, which, which, show, which, which, which shows that. And um, the, the, the entire um, tenet of the, the entire kind of emphasis is, is about security. It's very much to emphasize this is nothing not to, not to do with us. Although there, there is a place for us. There's a kind of place for us, which is they've set up these approved demonstration sites. <laughs> we've got one in Falmouth, and one in Truro, and then the next one's in Plymouth, and we've got even in Exeter, which is 100 miles from Carbis Bay, where we can go and approvedly register our displeasure, to whom I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> because you'd have to shout very loud to be heard in Car Carbis Bay. Right. And, and there's, a kind of, um, there's a kind of ritual being enacted here, which, which we're supposed to participate on in, in, in that way, which is kind of confusing, because I do really want to kind of express how I feel about these world leaders coming here but at the same time I don't want, to, don't want to be part of their circus and they're expecting me to go and perform my um my disapproval um in, in a way which kind of feeds into the the, the vision you know the, the spectacle you know in situationist terms of, of of these world leaders and how they see their world and, it, and it's interesting linking into that that the local hospital has cleared two wards in case in preparation for anything happening, in preparation for any violence in terms of the police or in terms of demonstrators, in terms of the media, in terms of the dignitaries, you know, the oligarchical elitist politicians that have come in there. Um, and they're kicking out the locals. I mean, there was a, a, a phone in on the local radio station from a, a lady who suggested that her, it was the hospital trust had, had basically told them that they needed to find a care home certainly in the short term, for their 97-year-old mother. Um, it's, it's almost as if the local people, it appears to me, are inconvenient at this point. And it's also that the demonstrators, because they kept being kept so far, it's just a, a representation, really, of, of what they call democracy, but perhaps we call something else. Oh, yeah. I, think, I think that's absolutely right. There's, 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 a, there's a, a real, a really apposite image being presented here, which is that of these world leaders who are basically politicians who've elevated themselves in this context into the state, into, into the, into, into the realm of statesmanship, but, um, but they aren't. They're people like Boris Johnson and uh, and and so on, and um, and they've created this artificial bubble, this heavily armed bubble in the middle of Cornwall, 
in the height of the preparations for the, the holiday season, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of major emphasis here is what the hell are they doing? This is insane. You don't you don't come here at that time unless unless you have to, and you don't come and disrupt things like this. And this, so what there is, I mean, you know, we've seen pictures of Beeritz and the various other G7s and G8s before, you know, the, you know, the big ones in 2005 and, 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 and so on. And, and you know, how do you, how do you kind of register the fact that actually this is really annoying? You know, it's, it, 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 it's, it does not expect us to perform for you. We're just coming out of lockdown and, um, and so on. But we would really would you like you to just not bother us like this. I, I, I've got a kind of real problem with this approach. And I think the other problem is that the media share it. They've got their own ringers dealing with Falmouth, the media, and they're being sent in Falmouth, which is even further from uh, Carbis Bay than I am here. So remember that when you see the coverage, everyone, because that, that's where they're covering it from. And um, it, it, they've, got their, they've got a huge, great edifice they built, temporary edifice, shut down all the car parks in the centre of the centre of the town in the height of holiday visit, visitations. And, um, you know, this isn't, this, is, this isn't good. But so also the press are in this bubble. The media are in this bubble too. And they're shut off from the world. And I cannot see the point of this, apart from the fact that it shoves our face in the fact that these powerful people are so much more, more so much superior to us. Because um, if, if they if they can't come here and meet the local people and talk to the local businesses and find out what the real issues are, are you know, we've got some of the poorest communities in Northern Europe, and they'll see none of that. They'll bypass Cam Warner Red Roof. They won't go anywhere near Snost or these places or, or, the, or the outskirts of Penzance. These kind of huge. Uh, you know, these large kind of social housing estates, which are really, really ha having it hard, all, part, all bypassed. They might as well be in, in Kathmandu. They might as well be in Timbuktu. If they won't, can't come here and meet us, what, what is the point of them coming here? If the security situation which they evoke is so uh, appalling, they really do need to go to an aircraft carrier that, or, or, or some, some kind of equivalent, not pretend to come, come and visit us. And then lock us out like this. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it goes long beyond um, beyond mild annoyance to the fact that this is actually the world we're living in. It's far too immediate an image of all the horrors and all that's wrong with our political systems and all the things which causes the cynicism, which leads to so many other bad effects. So what you're almost saying is that the corporate media are going to come down to a particular place in Cornwall for a particular amount of time. And they're going to then publicize, publish from a pre prepared script things that you're arguing we could have had if they'd met on an oil rig or, a, or a, a tanker or an aircraft carrier. That in actual fact, the benefits of coming to Cornwall are entirely for the attendees. And yeah, certainly, your article. Yeah. You know that they they come at the height of flaming June, when they could have organised something like this out of season and brought more resources and income to the local area. But actually, they've, they've done it at a point when they're turfing people out. So in terms of the economic gains for the area, it's not going to be that significant. But it's really about creating um, an image, a perspective, ideologically in our minds and that the corporate media are playing along with that illusion. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, and I think that's where we are. I think that's in, in, entirely where we are. And I think um, what's been happening, we've seen happening in, in the UK over the past few years is we've had someone um, in, in, in control of one of the major parties who threatened that view, who was someone who you would, who would insist on going and talking to me. I'm, I'm talking about Jeremy Corbyn and yes. the kind of Labour Party, which has sort of uh, recently kind of ceased to be in that respect. But but the, 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 this was kind of a big threat, and that was you know the, the, this this was a threat. It, this explains a lot. This is business as usual, but um, business as usual to what end? I, I I can't can't really see. I mean, it is quite horrific. You, you've you've mentioned the you know the the, the hospital there, but but also um, one of our Labour councillors, uh, um, Jane Kirkham, has been has been noting that. Um, that part of the homeless provision um, in Cornwall, which tends to be somewhat ad hoc sometimes, um, has been has actually been um, pushing people out. Of, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been pushing people out of um, of hotel accommodation where they've been placed because they are homeless in favour of uh, 
in favour of the kind of wider peripheral um, visitation by the media and whatever. So making more hotel beds available for more people from the BBC and from CNN and, 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 and so on. Because without that attention, as we're so shut out, this thing is completely meaningless. And, and, and that brings us probably to the, you know, the end of this point here is in terms of completely meaningless. Do you think that also carries over into the targets that will eventually be set at this G7 conference this weekend in terms of the, the well-being of, of planet Earth? I, 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 I do. And, and we're, we're, we're almost encouraged to expect that. Yeah, you know, we're encouraged to expect lip service. And, you know, and, and the kind of justification for having these face to face meetings in a time of COVID-19 um, is that they can dis discuss things um, in private. I don't like the sound of that, but um, on, the, on, the, on the plus side, perhaps, perhaps someone will get Boris Johnson in a room and give him a good batting around the head until he stops, for example, in interfering with the abilities of third world and developing countries to manufacture COVID vac vaccines for themselves. Uh, w without paying some kind of some, some kind of premium you know that what, what we're seeing here is um a, a, as usual a, a great dissonance between um what it is they claim they want to do and uh what it is they actually will do and l these these events tend to be lip service personif personified there's there's also the kind of almost kind of world constitutional issues about hang on why are these people unilaterally taking these these responsibilities which presumably should be invested in for example in the united nations um, which is a properly constituted body this is sort of ad hoc and chucks russia out every now and then <laughs> and, and then maybe lets them back back in after a while doesn't have china in it because because china doesn't qualify because um, the, the av average wage is very low despite the fact it's the major player in the capitalist world now um the average wage is very low but they want they want to talk to modi from india this uh, kind of part of the bonkersocracy which has come to rule large parts of the, uh, large parts of the world you know what is the point of talking to modi and not talking to china yeah that, it, none of it makes sense it is it is about them being seen to take things very very seriously and to be very very statesman statesperson like Fantastic. Well, as, as you know, we keep it to 10 minutes. I think you've covered all of the vital issues there in terms of um, how significant the conference will be and how disruptive it's been to, to local people. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much for coming on 10 by 6. Thank you. A pleasure. Um, wonderful. And we're having Paul back on the, the show again next week to talk about um, his book recently published, um, Diary of a Plague Year, um, in which he, as I say, we'll talk about next week, in which he focuses on the first six weeks of lockdown from last March into the, in through the spring. Um, but the thing that struck me about that interview, Tom, primarily was how the local people um, are become the victims, if you like. Um, and, and he rightly says in the article and in the piece, he says that they could have chosen any time of year. They could have chosen October, November, when a season's beginning to shut down, could have bring in extra resources into the community at a time when you know a lot of these institutions bed and breakfast hotels, leisure, leisure organisations, et cetera, need it. But they don't. They come in June, flaming June, apart from the last couple of days, in which people are having their ability to, to book into these hotels and, and bed and breakfast, et cetera, shut down in order to allow politicians and dignitaries, et cetera, to come in. So the actual amount of money that local businesses are making in Cornwall is no really no different to what it would be if they weren't there. So it's not an economic advantage. And then, of course, as people can see when they watch the, the interview, the fact that they're clearing hospital wards of people who aren't very well. And in this, as I say, one case where a 97-year-old, her children have been told to find her a place in a care home so that they can free up these wars. And I mean, let people can watch for themselves and it's it's just, 
it's, it's what you'd expect, unfortunately, if you've got your eyes open and your brain engaged. But moving on to topic number four this week, um, this one is around the, the cricketing tweets of, of, of Ollie Robinson, um, the England cricketer who's been who bowler who's been called up this week. Or oh, sorry, he was called up for the first test last week, and he's subsequently been banned from this this test, which starts today, um, because of tweets that he made when he was eighteen or nineteen um, of a racist, homophobic nature. And the ECB, the English Cricket Board, decided to ban him for this test match as a punishment. Um, we then had a, had a response, which we'll come on to and talk about at the moment. But then it subsequently we find out, that actually from the England captain, Joe Root, that there's a number of other England cricketers who have, shall we say, a shady background on social media in relation to the types of tweets that in their youth or in their early manhood that they that they published so it's about how do we respond to that do we ignore it or do we have a very sharp punishment so that actually sends out a positive message to others if you have any intention of playing for your national team or whoever um that you will be punished in the future i mean let's face it you know at the moment, we're told that employers go through Facebook profiles and social media profiles to see whether um, individuals are um, fitting the criteria for a specific workplace. And if it's found that they have a dodgy past, they don't even get an opportunity for an interview. So you could argue that if we're going to be treating people in that respect for the workplace, we should be doing the same for sports personalities or celebrities, etc. I mean, what's your take? Of course, yeah. I mean, I, I agree, Jason. Of course, we're 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 living in a time when you know abuse, particularly racist abuse on social media, uh, has reached extraordinary levels. That that um, you know, uh, black Asian footballers, cricketers, sports people of all all types, athletes uh, uh, are suffering daily abuse after performances. Even their own fans, support, so-called supporters of their own teams, give them horrific racist abuse to the extent that we recently saw a whole load of, um, you know, sports people, footballers and other types of sports people and organisations, clubs coming off social media for a week or so in protest to say enough. Uh, we're not standing for this anymore. Action needs to be taken. We have discussed before, I mean, action needs to be taken between governments, the police, and um, and the the tech companies to to tackle this, you know, they need to be uh, identifying perpetrators, arresting them, charging them, um, and, and getting them into prison um, because it's just not acceptable in an, any any decent society for for uh, this type of abuse to go on, whether it's racist, sexist, homophobic, um, uh, or whatever. What's so, your What's your take, Tom, on Rio Ferdinand yesterday, he came out and he said that our main thrust isn't to go around locking all these people up. Our main thrust should be to focus on a really comprehensive re-education programme. Yeah. What's your take on that? Well, I agree and I disagree. I mean, the second thing I fully agree with, the answer, the answer to prejudice tends to, tends to always be education. The answer to most things, uh, I, I believe, is about education. Um, both of our children and ongoing education, cradle to grave education for, for our, you know, including adults too throughout our lives. We should always, always be learning. Every day is a school day, should, should be everyone's motto. And, uh, um, you know, I think as a society, we need to learn so much more about our, our history, uh, our colonial past, how that's, you know, slavery and, and how all of that has affected uh, life in society today for, for all of us, obviously particularly for people from black and, and minority ethnic background. Um, so yes, totally agree that education is a, is a you know, is the way forward. Um, but I also think that far more should be done to identify and prosecute perpetrators. And uh, once people start going to prison, it's amazing how that, that abuse will, will, uh, will stop. Or there'll be a lot less of it once people are actually charged and go to prison. At the moment, people think they can just post 
uh, appallingly racist abuse uh, on social media completely with impunity. Um, and it, it, it staggers me. I can, you know, I've regularly written on social media in response to things, you know, uh, in, in, what, in what society do you feel it's acceptable? You know, our forebearers fought against the, the, the evils of Nazism and fascism, the most, the most violent, disgusting form of racism, essentially, Nazism. Our, our forebearers lay down their lives to fight against that. You know, race, modern day racists are spitting on their graves, in my opinion. Um, it's disgusting. And, um, you know, um, I mean, going back to the, the Ollie Robinson thing, the other thing that's, <laughs> that's really interesting about it is, um, uh, and I think it's right that, it, it, you know, he's suspended while it's investigated. And I think there should be some sort of punishment for him, um, f you know, that, that he's suspended from playing uh, for England for a, a short period of time. Um, but um, one of the things that's very interesting is that there's a, there's a propensity for our media and our politicians to use age, to describe age, particularly the teenage age range, in different ways to elicit different types of response. So I recently saw an article where there was a, 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 a violent attack and the victim was 16 and the perpetrator was 17. And in this newspaper tabloid newspaper article, the 16-year-old the victim was described as a 16-year-old boy and the 17-year-old perpetrator was described as a 17-year-old man. That's very interesting. I mean, given the legal def definition of, of adulthood is obviously uh, the, the age of 18, 18 plus. Um, and Oliver Dowden, the, the culture and sports secretary, um, in, uh, in essentially kind of, along with Boris Johnson, uh, somewhat excusing the behavior of Ollie Robinson, um, said something, I'm paraphrasing, but said something along the lines of, of that he tweeted or he, he posted those, those social media uh, posts as a teenager, and now that teenager is a man. Well, we understand that the, the, the things Ollie Robinson posted, he was 18 and 19 years of age. So he was by any legal definition already a man. So for Oliver Dowden to say he posted them when he was a teenager and now that teenager is a man uh, is, is, is rather dubious uh, use of language and stretching the legal definition of adulthood, isn't it? Well, it's, it's not dubious, it's just factually absolutely wrong. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I guess if you have a, a prime minister with a long history of racist narrative, um, both in the written and the spoken form, um, I suspect you know you, you're going to have ministers putting their heads above the parapet and coming up with ludicrous claims. Um, before we move on, just to finish off and, and you know, finishing off brilliantly, with, I think with Mark Rambrakash's response to to this polit political uh, decision to to step in on this on this discussion, I, th I think probably in the future we we'll probably need to look at prison prison system because I guess one of the arguments against sending people to prison is that one, we're all different. And I think for some people that, as they used to call it, short, sharp shock, does have a really positive response because it frightens them so much they never want to go near those institutions again. However, for other people, much, much less so, and it can, as, as some criminologists will argue, become a school of crime. In other words, they go in having been abusive on social media and they come out being able to, you know, steal a top of the range car in 30 seconds. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's something that really needs to be looked at. And I think the individual personalities of those people involved. I mean, if you lack empathy and you lack caring because of your upbringing, then being sent to prison is probably not the best way forward. Um, if you want to educate people and, and change people's behaviour. But I think that's a discussion. If we can just finish off, though, with uh, Mark Rapprakash, I think Nell's probably the last four or five years, hasn't he, Tom, um, in his response? Irony isn't there with our, you know, our Prime Minister um, getting involved. I think it's unwelcome 
Um, he himself has used racist language against Muslim people, against black people. Um, he was voted into power, I think, on a very divisive anti-immigrant Brexit campaign. And race hate went through the roof under uh, during that campaign. So I, I'm not. A, I I think he's trying to bear undue influence in this case. Um, it's almost as if uh, his influence on the ECB. He wants to get some sort of outcome uh, that he thinks is right. I, I I think there's a real irony. If I was Ollie Robinson, I'm not sure I would want uh, Boris Johnson involved and in, and in trying to support uh -huh. him. Right. Let's. I think Mark Rabakash, ex-England cricketer for many years, batsman back in the 1980s, early 1990s, um, he, he nailed it. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I was Ollie Robinson, I wouldn't want a known racist <laughs> coming to my defence because it hardly um, it hardly makes his case any uh, any more provable. Okay, let's move on then to to something very similar. Um, and it's the, again the the people who are abusing and and booing um, in this instance England footballers because the England manager and the England players have come out and basically said we are going to continue to take the knee. We believe it's a really important symbolic moment. It's only a small part of what needs to be done, but it keeps it in the public imagination. Um, and of course, you've then got all these other people, including again right-wing politicians uh, who say you know, it's, it's a waste of time, it's politicising sport, we shouldn't have any any place for politics and sport. Uh, we've had politics and sport forever. So them saying this, I don't know who they're actually trying to appeal to, but they seem to have an understanding of a particular demographic who might be like a goldfish, goes around the tank and has forgotten everything that happened 30 seconds ago. Well, right-wing right -wing politicians love to say keep politics out of sports until they choose to defend someone that's that's posted racist tweets. Of course, of course, you're absolutely that's spot on, Tom. Spot on, Tom. Absolutely, and the hypocrisy, um, you know, is 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 crushing in terms of the weight upon many of our shoulders. Um, so, what's your take on it? And in terms of you know, this whole take the knee. I mean, in the moment we're going to listen to. Uh, an extended clip from James O'Brien on, on, on LBC where he takes on somebody who admitted to going to the Romania game last Sunday afternoon uh, and booing. And it's it's the brilliant how he you know he takes this guy's um, comments apart. But you know, what's your take, Tom? Uh, well, my take is that uh, the booing disgusts me. I find it utterly abhorrent. Uh, it makes me ashamed to be British, um, to be booing our England football players uh, or anyone who takes the knee to say, I believe in equality and I challenge racism, I stand up against racism. Everyone in the country should do that. I mentioned earlier, our forebearers did that in fighting against Nazism in the Second World War, an extreme example of standing up to the most disgusting, uh, you know, genocidal form of racism our, our, our civilization has ever known. Um, it, it spits on the memory of our forebearers for people to be uh, to support racism, racist causes, and to to boo anyone. You know, perhaps especially our own England football team. Um, you know, for for taking a need just to say we stand we stand up for equality. We stand for a society that's decent and that's not racist. Um, and we stand for equality in people's rights. And uh, it's extraordinary that anyone would be so uh, triggered, I suppose is the, the modern term, triggered to feel the need to boo that. that um, it says something about their, uh, the, their understanding of the issues, but it says something about the level of their humanity, I think, um, which makes me feel rather ashamed to be British. Um, and even there was a Conservative MP, you know, who came out and, and said how disgusting he found taking the knee and that he wasn't going to, to watch it. He was going to switch his television off until the kickoff time because he couldn't bear to, to watch it. And he was so critical of it. I mean, it's just despicable. And of course, a lot of that, a lot of this animosity to Black Lives Matter, to taking the knee has come from America. Um, most of our right wing politics, you know, is imported from America. 
from Trump land. Um, and of course, Trump and others were, were you know, instrumental in, in um, uh, you know, disparaging Colin Kaepernick, uh, the American footballer who took a knee to highlight inequality and police brutality against black people in America. Uh, and, and ever since, and, and uh, you know, disparaging the Black Lives Matter movement and, uh, you know, trying to equate it to Marxism um, and so forth. So I, I just find it all thoroughly distasteful. And even in the last couple of days, our England men's football team manager, Gareth Southgate, wrote a very intelligent and reasoned message to the nation, um, published in an article. And... Uh, Stand Up to Racism Dorset posted that on a, a local page, um, Dorchester News and View page on Facebook. And uh, it was met with a, a whole load of um, racist comments and far right ideology, um, which I found truly sickening. Um, thankfully, the, um, the admins of that page removed a couple of the main perpetrators of that racism. But that's awful to see. Um, but I have to keep reminding myself, much as sometimes this stuff upsets me and I, I think, wow, you know, this country's become incredibly reactionary and incredibly racist because, of course, the people with wealth and power are teaching us, teaching the public to have enemies, you know, in the media. You know, they're stealing all the money, folks. They're stealing all the money and sticking it in their tax havens whilst cutting all our public services and saying, uh, you know, that the nurses can have a 1% pay rise that equates to a cut whilst they're stealing all the money uh, and th they won't get away with that forever unless they can teach us all to blame others blame other people immigrants black people um, disabled people people on benefits they teach us to have those you know those scapegoats the media do it the right-wing politicians do it um, and we've got to recognize that and fight back and uh, have a sense of solidarity and say no um, we're not going to hate on other poor people while you while you steal all our money uh, and destroy all our public services. We've had enough of that. We're not standing for it anymore. Out you go. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so um, you know, I, th I think we need to just re reject all that. But the, yeah, the last thing that's right. I forgot for a sec what I was going to say. But the last thing I wanted to say on that is that um, sometimes I, I do think oh my God, you know, especially when you go on social media and you see so many racist and appalling, sexist, homophobic comments, you think we've become a, a really prejudiced society. But then I, I try and remind myself, there are more of us than there are of them. It's true in America. We just saw it at the last election. It's true in this country. I strongly believe it. And as, as you pointed out with the, the article on the responses to the Echoes article uh, about Gypsy's Travellers, um, you know, there are huge numbers of very decent people who aren't racist and who stand up for what's right. And there's more of us than there are of them. Yeah, um, totally agree. Totally agree. And that keeps us sane at the end of the day. Um, a couple of things um, I want to pick on. I was sort of a brilliant meme two or three days ago, which showed basically it was from the response or, or from the perspective, I should say, of the people who were booing take the knee and you had um on one side of the of the image you had somebody who was standing up against racism for the benefit of you know all these black people who've been treated hideously and heinously over over centuries and then on the other side of the meme you had this guy doing a monkey chant at a football ground and basically you know, their argument you know, who, to those who oppose take the knee that this is bad the standing up for black people but this is good this is the freedom of speech that they want or the freedom of expression that they want is to be able to go to football grounds pay their money through the, to go through the turnstile go into their seat and then be as, as disgusting and vile as, as they want to be because they argue we paid our money without any of those footballers, about any of those sports personalities, or anybody around them responding because they argued this is their freedom to say and express themselves as they wish. Um, but that isn't a decent society. That isn't a democratic society. 
that isn't society that I want to live in. You know, for me, I want those people who believe like that, I want them gone. I want them out of my consciousness. You know, wherever they happen to go, that's fine, but just go somewhere else. So that I'm surrounded by all those people that you've just identified, Tom. You know, the decent, generous, the empathetic, the caring, the ones that will stand up against prejudice. I want them around me because I know that my life will be so much more improved by that. And the other thing as well, just quickly, is this idea of, you know, anybody who stands up to these racist, vile bigots are Marxists. Well, whether they are or whether they aren't is irrelevant. All you've simply got to do is ask them a question about Marx or ask them a question about that critical philosophy. And they go silent. You'd never hear from them again because they throw out the word Marxist like confetti without having any understanding of the nuance, the context, the, the content of Marxist theorists and alike. Because it's for them, it's they perceive it's just an ad hominem. You're a Marxist. But they've got absolutely no intellectual or academic engagement in, in, in engagement in the word in which they just used. Um, and that, and even Gary Lineker was accused of being Marxist, wasn't he? And he responded really well. I know you saw that, Jace. Yeah. You, you tell, tell, the, tell the viewers, Tom, what you said, because well, it was brilliant. I can't remember the exact wording, but yes, Lineker, who obviously, um, uh, I, I want to say it, I'm, I'm a fan of Gary Lineker. I think throughout his, his life as a player, and, and more particularly since he retired from playing and presents on television, he's... Um, uh, I think he takes very good, uh, uh, decent stances on equality issues um, about women in sport, about black players in sport, about uh, racism, um, issues around Brexit as well, challenging the far right, uh, as he did with Stephen Lee Actually Lennon. And uh, I, I admire him very much. And uh, he was, you know, quite outspoken in condemning the Boers and was instantly labelled a Marxist. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. Um, and he responded something like, uh, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I'm not, not into marking at all. I, I didn't even come back for corners. Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> it was brilliant. And it had thousands, tens of thousands of, of retweets and likes. And again, that fills you full of, you know, a sort of, sort of mild euphoria, you know, that... Uh, that many, many people, as you rightly say, are just decent people who are being crushed by a whole range of different things. And by standing together, at least we can keep the ceiling from coming down any further. It's when we get atomized and, and become individualized that we just can't take the weight anymore. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'll, you're sticking with football. The, um, you're going to show the clip from... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, we've got the, uh, the clip, which I think is, is fantastic from, from James O'Brien. Um, yeah, so this is Tom, who works in the city, who phoned, who rang up, and I'm not sure whether he's regretting it. He probably should be. He rang up James O'Brien the other day, um, about having gone to the Romanian game and about having booed, and this was how it played out. Tom is in Hampstead. Tom, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning. Okay. Um, I was actually at the Riverside yesterday, um, and I booed the knee. Okay. Why, why do you think um, the players before, are doing it? I I know the reasons that that they said that they're doing it. Um, so you booed I'm that not, then? Uh, no. Um, so, point, so you booed the reasons that they haven't said? My undertone is that when I hear the word Black Lives Matter, I think of burning buildings in America, attacking the police and violent protests. Yes. So I'm not... Have you anti, tried not I'm to? Not, uh, <clears throat> sorry? Have you tried not to think that? Have you tried to think about the words and what they well, actually one mean? Of, well, one of my aunties actually was killed during a Black Lives Matter protest last year. And that's so, appalling. But have you have you tried thinking about what the words actually mean? I understand what they mean, and I agree what, with what, what they, do they mean. mean? And, <clears throat> well, they, they're saying that Black Lives Matter also matters. Black lives, black lives also matter. I understand that. So why point, are you booing it? 
because of what I've just said about what I think about when I think of those words. Now, can I, if, if, if I, if, 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 if I, I walk into a room and you're, and you're kneeling, I don't get to tell you why you're kneeling or what you're showing support for. I get only to ask you. So we've asked the footballers why they're doing it, and they've told us, Tom. Which I, I, I respect. And, well, you don't you know, respect. The polar opposite of respecting it, mate, is booing it. I'm afraid it couldn't be a... a, a, a bigger u-turn or a, or a more violent opposition to respect than the idea of booing something so you don't respect but it you, you completely me, and categorically but, disrespect it so let's just make sure we're using words accurately <clears throat> absolutely but it's you know i think if you make a bold statement rather than just taking the knee every week actually i think i would respect it more but it's it's just a complete like politically correct statement done. But, but again, you're so telling them why they're doing it and they're giving you a very different answer to that question. So what do you think qualifies uh, you to say, oh, I know that's why you say you're doing it, but I know better? Well, again, that's your opinion. You know, I, I you know, for me... No, no, you I'll boo them. Like, they've told you why they're doing it and you're so booing them for completely different reasons. But then that's my opinion. Is that, you know, your, your opinion is that you know better than them as to why they're kneeling. You claiming no, it was I, my I, opinion I, a minute I've ago. I've read, I've read what they said about why they're why they're kneeling. You know, I've done, I've been going to games for ten years, home and away. Um, I'm going next week to Croatia at home. I'll, I'll be at all the Euro games, and I'm also going to Qatar next summer. What, uh, do, next you, what, Christmas, what, sorry. what do you think? It, what, what impact do you have? Mm. Think it has on the players when they get booed by their own fans before the game starts? Do, do you think I, it I think, might <clears> g them up I, a bit? I, Honestly, I think that part's bad, and I'm one of the people that do it. I, I think it's bad because, you know, England are going into a major tournament, and we're basically, the biggest story at the moment is the fact that there's, there's, a, there's a divide between the fans and the players. Well, some fans, mate. I think you got drowned oh, yeah, out fans, by the yeah, majority. But, but, just just a small account, proportion yeah, of take, fans who many people it's, think it's, are it's, racist, but I presume you reject that description. I, I, I'm absolutely outright not racist. But, yeah. you, know, but I, you I boo the Black Lives like, Matter <clears> kneeling. I blew the black. Yeah. I, uh, excuse but me, you're I definitely not black. racist. Yeah. Sorry. What do you think the word support means? Support what in, in what context? Any well, context support you want. Getting behind, getting behind, and getting behind, isn't it? You know, encouraging. Yeah. So you're there to actually make them play worse, are you? Uh, well, no. You know, I spent probably our, well, our best part of. 50, 60,000 over the last 10 years following in home. I was in Russia two years ago. Yes, but we're talking about yesterday. I mean, by booing the players, do you think you are more likely to make them perform better or worse? Um, I think it's a very touchy subject. That's not got... It's really not. You you can ask me the same question if you want. If you boo me... Well, put yourself in that situation. What do you do for a living, Tom? Oh, so sorry. What do you do for a living? I work in the city. Okay, so if I came into your office and started booing you and and um, uh, disrespecting you and and you say to me, "Why are you doing that?" I'm but just I'm trying not, to do my job. I'm I mean, not, I said to you, not, "Hang on a hang minute, on, Tom. I know on. what you're really up to. You're not doing that." And, and do you think you would perform better or worse at work? But hang on, I'm not disrespecting or like. Yeah, yes, you are. You're booing your them. Job. We've I'm already established that. You. So. Would you be no, 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 more no. likely to make them play better or worse by booing them? It's not a trick question. But I'm not, but I'm not I'm, you know, when the players come on the pitch, they get a clap, we sing their or something like that. There's and then you boo them. Like so that. do you not. think booing them will make them play better or worse? But it's not about the football, why I'm booing them. <laughs> I don't care. Do you think it will make them play better or worse? I mean, I guess worse. But that's, <laughs> and then, that's and here you point. are. Are you going to boo them at the Croatia game? Absolutely. Yeah? Cool. You're a massive yeah. supporter, you are, aren't you? How big's your flag? Sorry? How big's your flag? I've got a British flag just to, you know... Yeah, I, know. Really, I know you have. You don't need to tell me that. I'm just wondering how big it is. Uh, I can't remember, sorry. All right, and how hard do you wave it when you're booing the England players? Uh, I don't wave a flag. Oh, call yourself a football fan. I know, I know. Unbelievable, isn't Mate, it? do me a favour. Seriously, keep keep your thoughts, that's fine. If you want to believe that you know better as to why these human beings who've told you why they're doing something are really doing it, you, you've got a better insight. Just don't boo them, because we want to win, right? And you've just but said you, yourself that you, by booing just, them, you make them play just, worse. Can't um, you just keep just, quiet for, for, for a month? I'm, well, but the problem is, it, look, look at Millwall. If, honestly, no, I James, don't want to look my, at Millwall. I don't support my, Millwall. My, I want England to my, win. You don't want my, them to win. Why are you going to the games? Why are you using up a seat that a proper fan could have? Well, you know, it's based on loyalty, and I was imagining... Loyalty to the people that you boo? No, yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, here ends loyalty. today's meeting of the Brains Trust.
he's very good, James O'Brien. Uh, he obviously has his detractors, and there are things that he said that I you know, vehemently disagree with in the past. But obviously, he's particularly known for his uh, his similar discussions with people about about Brexit issues, and he's uh, he's very good at, uh, at highlighting people's hypocrisy. I guess. Yes, absolutely. And that takes us on to um, the very last topic of the day, and our predictions for the Euros. Okay. Um, so for those not remotely interested in football, in football not, so, thanks for tuning in this week. Yeah, yeah. See you next we'll, time. We'll but, uh, yeah, we, yeah. we thought, uh, given that it's the start of the, the Euros, um, you know, big tournament, uh, England, Wales and Scotland, they're all there. And uh, so we thought we'd just have a chat about uh, uh, what we think might happen, who, what our predictions are. So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, um, it seems like it's potentially quite an open tournament this year in that there's, there's sort of six or seven teams that are reasonably short in the betting um, as, uh, in terms of winning the tournament. There's probably six or seven teams that, that, that could. Having said that, I mean, the European Championships has traditionally thrown up some surprises with, mm. you know, complete outsider teams, you know, 80 to one shots. Uh, winning uh, numerous times over the years, so there's Greece, bound to be surprises. Hmm? Yeah, Greece, Greece, Hungary. Was it Hungary? Don't remember Hungary. Hungary. No. Who be who be West Germany in the seventies? Czech, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Sorry. Yeah, of course yeah. it was with the. Was he called Padenka, the guy that did the little chip? Yeah, Penalty. that's right. And it, it then got named after him. Palenka or Padenka. Palenka, Palenka. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he's a national hero in the Czech Republic, isn't he, for that yeah. that that little dink yes. uh, penalty in the penalty shootout. So um, yeah, so one or two big surprises over over the years, and there's bound to be some this year. You know, there's bound to be a one of the big teams that doesn't get through the group stage or goes out in the second round against a minnow or, or whatever. That's bound to happen. Well, we got Netherlands, um, um, Netherlands, France, and. Netherlands, France, and Portugal in the same. France, Portugal, Germany. France, Portugal, Germany. Uh, and Hungary. Hungary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, th this this uh, this championship, so-called Group of Death. There's there's always one yeah, in every is. major tournament. <laughs> so yeah, France, Germany, Portugal, Hungary. Um, obviously, two of France, Germany, and Portugal are expected to go through, um, but who knows? Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, the other there, are the, there are the third place. Yeah, you know, so people, I was just, just going to say, go top, on the, third the other surprise one was Denmark, wasn't it, in 92? And oh, they, yes, of course. And, and they only came in because I think Yugoslavia was kicked out because of the Balkans War. So they came in as a wild card and went on and won it. Absolutely, with the Loudrup brothers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Been, that's at least three major shocks over the years. Who knows, you know? Maybe um, maybe we'll have a shock this year. Maybe England will win. So let's let's start off then with um, who you believe will be the the top scorer. Uh, so my individual. money is my money is uh, not just not just metaphorically speaking, but my money is literally already on Lukaku of Belgium, Romelu Lukaku, right. ex Manchester United player. Um, had a very good season in Italy, um, been banging goals all season in the form of his life, prime of his life, uh, and will be uh, probably set up for loads of goals by, um, by Kevin De Bruyne, um, you know, assist King De Bruyne uh, and others in a, in a decent Belgium team. So, uh, yeah, so my money's on Lukaku for that. Obviously, I hope it's Harry Kane. I, Harry Kane scores 10. And, and we win the championship. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's Mbappe of, of France, there's Griezmann of France, there's, um, uh, you know, a number of others, um, you know, uh, Immobile of Italy and, uh, um, yeah, various others who, um, you know, who could take it, the, the Memphis Depay of, of uh, the Netherlands and, and others. So, um, do you think? So yeah, it's quite a few. But my money's on Lukaku. Do you think? Uh, you? Do you think Netherlands will get far enough, or um, 
for I think they'll um, I think they'll reply. prove through their group because the, I think they're in a, a, a reasonably um, a reasonably weak group. I think they'll cruise through the group, but I don't think they're a strong, particularly strong Netherlands team. Maybe wrong about that. But I don't see them getting, you know, perhaps beyond the quarterfinals. Um, I may be wrong on that, but I, I don't see them winning um, or get, getting, um, perhaps getting as far as the semis. Who, who's your tip for uh, top goal scorer, Jace? So it's, it's, it's always really difficult, this, because I'm not... The reason I don't bet is because if I do, if I put money on a horse to win the national, a cow will win it. So I'm, <laughs> the reasons that I don't bet are very obvious. Um, but obviously looking from the outside, um, I, I hope, I really hope that Harry Kane or Marcus Rashford or... Um, Obviously, one of the England players. You know, it's a shame that um, Scotland and Wales haven't got a really prolific goal scorer. I know Wales have got Gareth Bell, but um, it's, it is a shame that um, they both haven't got somebody more prolific that could possibly take them, you know, quite a distance. Um, I think a lot of people are are ignoring, you know, um, Cristiano Ronaldo. He scored at thirty plus goals again for for Juve um, in this last season. Um, you know, Kylian Mbappe. I mean, if you give him the right service, he's going to have, you know, he's going to have fun. Any, to be fair, especially some against the defences. I mean, the obvious thing about the European Championships is they tend to be harder than the World Cup to get a long way because there's a lot more stronger teams. Um, so you can probably get to quarter semi-finals. Um, in a World Cup, and sometimes you don't really come across anybody who's recognised as being world beaters, whereas in, in the European Championships, the chances of that happening, I know England, for example, if they want to get to the final winner, they've got a hard, hard route to take, given how it's going to play out from winners and runners-up in, in different groups. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you've got Robert Lewandowski, but I just don't think that Poland will do enough to enable him to come close to being top scorer, unless, of course, he has a good run very early on. So there are some great goal scorers, and as you rightly pointed out, um, it does apply, for example, in Lukaku's situation, it does um, have a lot to do with who's behind you and creating the chances. Um, and how so, far you go in the tournament. And how far you go in the tournament, of course. So before we come on to the team that you expect to win it, who are your um, dark horses? Well, I suppose, I mean, teams like Croatia, for example, you know, or, or perennial dark horses over the last 10 or 12, maybe 15 years, but but have always outperformed their odds um, and had some great players, been, been one of the stronger teams in Europe in the last few years. And of course, may, beat us in the semi-finals of the, World, the last World Cup and... Uh, and lost in the final. Um, they're in the group with it with England, of course. Our first game up on Sunday against Croatia. Um, uh, so they're a dark horse. Um, and Italy are, are not particularly fancied going into it. They may struggle in terms of goals. They tend to play one up top, and uh, and uh, you know with Immobile, who's who's obviously particularly immobile. Um, but, um, I mean, they're, they're unbeaten in, I think it's 23 games uh, going into the tournament. Uh, you know, but Robert Man Mancini's done an amazing job. He's, he's, yeah. he's turned the cultural stereotype of Italy on its head in terms of the yeah. way they play football now, possession-based on the front foot. So I think, you know, Italy are one of my dark horses, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Certainly a, for a form team, you know. Yes. They're perhaps the form team going into it. Um, yeah, I don't fancy Germany. I don't think they're, I mean, they're, they're obviously sort of past masters at coming good when it comes to major championships. Um, and, uh, you know, people talk of them having a, a very strong mentality and uh, they're good at winning. Um, but I just don't feel that their squad is, is strong enough compared to, you know, squads of the past of Germany that have won tournaments. I don't think they have anything like the quality uh 
you know, that they've had in the past or, or compared to other squads, including England's. So I don't see Germany winning it. Um, I think they, and, one yeah. thing about Germany there, and I think as you pointed out, is that as they get further and further in tournaments, they have the experience, but they have the game management. And I think they, they can suss out the opposition and know what they have to do, whether it means going to penalties or whether it means you know taking the, the chance in extra time or whatever it is. They seem to have that mentality and ability to identify within their opponents what needs to be done. And as we saw with the World Cup, I think in 2014 in Brazil, the way they absolutely destroyed Brazil because they'd done their homework. Yeah. And instead of letting Brazil go on the front foot, they exploited the fact that Brazil were really weak at the back. Um, and they did it in a, a fan, you know, fantastic. It was brilliant just watching it on YouTube now, seven years later, the dismantling of Brazil, you know, never perceived, never been seen before. It was superb. It was extraordinary. But, but I mean, conversely, you know, uh, the, they're the opposite of Italy in that they're, they're going into the tournament with, kind of record poor form for a German team. They just recently lost 6-0 to Spain. Uh, and they also lost a World Cup qualifier to North Macedonia. Yeah. Um, Although I think North Macedonia... Yeah, don't take your eyes off North Macedonia. I don't think they're obviously going to win it, but I think that they've really impressed me. And, of course, the other thing about Germany is they just, they just beat Lithuania 7-0 um, a few days back. So, you know, they're not going in on, you know, the back of total bad form. No. Um, but yeah, I, I, I probably don't see them um, winning the tournament. But in terms of, you know, in terms of okay. sort of far bets, you know, if you're gonna, if you want, if you had, basically, you're gonna lose your house in the morning, and you, you saw that there was a team that you could possibly put a grand on to to save your house, who would it be? I mean, I'm talking about the, the you know, the wild cards here still. Yeah, well, one, I mean, one team, one team, Tom. There's, there's a couple of things there, Jace. I mean, if you're going to lose your house, don't, don't bet any money on the European Championship. No, 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 I understand that, but that was Obviously. just the way I was phrasing it. But you know, if, yeah, what, what is no, your I mean, big wild card? If someone are coming out of the and, darkness, what would it be? Well, well, if you, you know, there's I'll that phrase. The if you, if you were going to put your mortgage on something. Then, then I'd probably say France, although although Belgium, Belgium are my actual team that I think will win. But I mean, if you were going to put your mortgage on, if you had to put your mortgage on something, I'd probably say France. You know, uh, go for the World current, Cup current, first. Current World Cup holders, and you know, uh, have become got an incredibly strong team, and and over the last sort of 15, 20 years, have been regular winners of big big tournaments. Uh, so, but if you if you were had to try and put some money on something at decent odds, yes. which I think is what you're asking there, yes. a bit of a dark horse, I'd probably say Croatia. Interesting. Interesting. Not huge odds. I think they're around 16 to 1 or something. But They're yeah. interesting. I mean, I've, I've sort of been doing a bit of reading around over the last 24 hours in preparation for this, just to get my head around, um, you know, Who's there and what they're going, what they're about, and it's, it's interesting how the number of times that Turkey and Denmark have come up with some people, some pundits, um, arguing that you know Denmark probably lose, uh, uh, probably sorry, or probably haven't got the the, the the clinical striker, but we saw when they played England, didn't we? Whenever it was in the last twelve months or so, that they they beat us two one, and they really outplayed us. Um, and they were, you know, they held the ball well. Christian Eriksen obviously is at the heart of that team. So I think, you know, from my little knowledge of having really looked at, and obviously not studying betting as I don't, um, but Turkey and um, and Denmark possibly are the Greece of 2020, 2021 as it is. Yeah, so who's I mean, they, they could both out, outplay their odds. I, I want to give a little shout out to Wales and Scotland too. Who um, you know, I think both are, are improved teams. Wales over a, a, a bit of a longer period of time, you know, three four years now. Wales have, have been a decent team. Scotland more recently have have turned things around and, and improved dramatically, I'd say. And um, uh, you know, I, I'd like it. Wouldn't it be fabulous to see all three home nations get through the group stage at least? Yes, absolutely. Um, and and into the It'd knockout rounds and. Uh, 
uh, it would be great, great to see. Imagine two or three home nations in the quarterfinals. You know, it's going to get really exciting for us all. So, and I, I think Wales and Scotland have both got, got, you know, reasonable chances of getting through the group stages into the second round, maybe into the quarterfinals. Um, I think it's. I think it'll be amazing. I think it'll be amazing. I think England will get through to the knockouts. I think Wales might get through for the skin of their teeth, but I don't think Scotland will. I think Scotland, if they go behind, they're really going to struggle because they haven't got anybody up front. They got don't get me wrong, this you know, McTominay, um, John McGinn. Um, they got some they got some great players in that team um, in terms of club teams, but I just don't think they've got the spike at the top end that if things go against them, that they can dig themselves out of a hole. Whereas you've, you've got the, obviously you've got the magic of, of Bale, you've got pace of Dan James. Um, so they are, Wales are capable of, I think, playing intelligent football and getting through to the next round, although I don't think they'll probably get much further than that. Um, but not Scotland, not for me. I mean, Wales have got a tough group, really. Italy, Turkey and Switzerland. Right? I think quite a tough group. Uh, arguably, but high Scotland on. could have an easy go. I mean, Scotland got England, obviously, in the group with England, uh, Czech Republic and uh, and Croatia. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Scotland get a result against either England or Croatia, you know, the, big, the so-called big two in the group. I wouldn't be surprised if Scotland got something, including against England. You know, it's always tough playing those home internationals, as they used to be called, you know, the, the home nation. Always tough. Um, you know, I'll put my head above the parapet here. Play Scotland. I'll put my head above the parapet here. It's it's Scotland or Czech Republic for the last spot in that group. Yeah. For England and Croatia will will get through fairly comfortably. Yeah. Um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but again, I think the experience will and the and the, the talent for both Croatia and England will be enough. And it's it's Modric is probably last for all as well, so he's going to be. Um, you know, the, the, the keeping the ticking going in that midfield. Um, yeah, so I think you know. So who's, who's your um? So who's your prediction as the overall winner then, Jace? I think if you're going to go with class experience, I think it, it's it's hard not to it's hard to not to see past France. Hmm. I think you know they they do look terrific team. I think this is probably Ronaldo's last hurrah. So I think Portugal will be in there in their abouts. Um, obviously, you've got the obvious ones. You've got the Spain, um, like we talked about Germany. I, I don't think the Netherlands will challenge. Um, so it's the, and I think Italy, I think Italy, as we've already spoken about as well. So, but in terms of England, um, I think they should get at least to the semi-finals as long as they get everybody playing well and everybody shrugging away the the pressure that comes from being an England footballer. And certainly, in terms of the media, uh, the media does no favours at all for for England teams of the past. But my overall. I think my overall final, and I don't know how it's going to pan out in terms of who meets who, but I think France versus Italy or France versus Portugal um, will probably be the final. Hmm. Yeah? I, I agree. For, you know, France, you've got to say, are incredibly strong. The marginal favourites with the, uh, you know, the bookmakers ahead of England and, and Belgium. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, they're very tough, uh, proven winners and an incredibly strong squad with scoring ability from around the pitch. So, uh, yeah, France are going to be very, very tough to beat. Um, I think a France Belgium I... final actually, would, if, if England don't get there, I think a France Belgium final would be terrific. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have any combination of France, England, and Belgium in, in yeah. a final, would, would, yes, it would be terrific, Tom. wouldn't it? It would, mate. Really, I desperately hope it's going to be England. Uh, a lot, a, there's a lot of, I think, heavy lifting done by Harry Kane in terms of the England team and our scoring abilities. Hope he stays fit and well and, and is banging in goals 
we certainly got a, a good, strong squad. You got lots of young, very talented players, and I think a, a very good manager. Um, though I think one or two, he's left out one or two players from the squad that I might have included. Um, but um, but who, yeah, who I, 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 I think England have got a chance. I think Italy have a chance. I don't, I don't particularly fancy Germany or Spain or the Netherlands. I don't particularly fancy Portugal, to be honest. Um, so I, I, I think France, England, Italy or Belgium, it's, I think it's going to be one of those four. I'll be proven to be completely wrong because it will end up being Denmark or something, some complete uh, outsider. Um, but uh, my, anyway, my, my money's on Belgium. I think the combination, I'm a huge fan of De Bruyne. I think he's probably the best midfielder in the world at the moment. Um, incredible, talented midfielder, obviously. Creates so many chances for others as well as scoring himself. Lukaku is probably the in the you know best best form of any striker going into it, and I think the combination of the two could win it for Belgium. Um, so yeah, my money's on Belgium. That's my my tip. I would have I would have agreed with you, and you know, and like you say, I think they've got an extremely good chance. My only thing about Belgium is is they're over dependent upon De Bruyne. Um, if De Bruyne is not functioning, or De Bruyne is marked out of the game, or if he gets an injury, and I know he's carrying, obviously, this had this this issue with his um, fractured cheekbone. Um, if he's not on top form, um, that they're, they're talisman. Yeah. Um, whereas I think... Not with, Hazard, but, of course. They got Eden yeah, Hazard. He, he, he hasn't done anything since he left Chelsea, and he's had so many injuries, he's hardly played. Don't get me wrong, he might come to this tournament and be... But I think it's all round squads. I think France and England have the best. The only problem I think for England is is their like the last the loss of um, Harry Maguire um, because he's so important for them at the back. And it's picking up on the point you said that there's you know, some of the people that Gareth Southgate hasn't picked. I and mean, who would they be? James Ward Prowse, um, in particular. You know, I, I would have included him. I mean, he's relatively local to us here in Dorset, being at, at Southampton. Um, yeah, one or two others, but I mean, he's probably a... a um, and I think, I personally, would <laughs> say, you know, um, uh, that, uh, I mean, he, people say he's a, you know, just a free kick merchant, and but his all-round game is far, far more than that. And uh, I think he's had an except, another exceptional season. Um, and with... Um, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see him with um, names escape me. <laughs> the Villa. Uh, I've, I've, Jack Villa Grealish. Player. Jack Grealish. Grealish. Why has his name gone out of my head? So I, I'd love to see Jack Grealish and James Ward Prowse in the same England team because Grealish should win all the penalties because, you know, he falls over for a living. And uh, I mean, that's partly because he's incredibly talented and goes past players. And, and makes things happen by doing so and gets fouled. Um, but he also goes down rather easily, <laughs> to use a euphemism. And, uh, you know, so Gr Grealish and Ward Prowse in the same team would be pretty lethal because Grealish would win about 10 free kicks around the edge of the box every game and Ward Prowse would stick four of them away at least. So, um, anyway. But um, I, I, I I, I, just I, on I, that I, point, I really hope Grealish is selected to play. I hope he's not just used as a 20-minute sub at the end to, to affect games. I think he, he warrants a place in the lineup. He's got something different from the other players, I think, in terms of going past people and doing quick one twos. And we've seen that in the friendlies. You know, he's got something extra. Pick him in the team, Gareth. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think Jack Grealish is phenomenal talent. I think I would probably would have, I would have left James Ward Prowse out purely because we've got Phil Foden. And I think mm. you, you can have too many luxuries. Um, so I, I would have, you know, bear in mind, for me, the big disappointment was not taking Mason Greenwood because Mason Greenwood in those situations, people aren't used to Mason Greenwood. They haven't come up against him. He can score with both feet. He's developed amazingly in the last 12 months as a, as a club player in terms of dropping back and filling in. So, you know, I think Mason Greenwood, hopefully, if he gets, gets the right mentality and kicks fit, would be an extraordinary talent in the future. And it's, it's a shame he's not at this tournament. He could be a big player in a couple of years' time, couldn't he? Yeah, exactly. Tournament, next World Cup, whatever, you know, he's, he could be a, a big player for England, for sure. Exactly. Well, a summer of excitement. We've got, we got the end of the French Open, 
uh, tennis. We've got Wimbledon after that. We've got, um, you know, golf and all sorts of other sports. And of course the Euros uh, and, and then we've got the Olympics. So a summer, a sporting feast to enjoy. Let's, let's hope, uh, let's hope all three of our home nations that are taking part do well. That's the yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that their fans are happy and they feel encouraged by their performances. Definitely. Yeah. And, and by their supporters. <laughs> and that, yes. Yeah. So apart from the, uh, the little beauty that will stick on the end in the moment, that's it for another week. Super. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jace. Massive pleasure. Have a good week. And you, thank you very much. And uh, you take care. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. See you next take week. Care. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Would you mind if I said a few words? What's it got to do with you? Oh, yes, I'd love that. <clears throat> The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. All thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Until we meet again. Beautiful. Hey, hey. Please move back. This area is very dangerous, OK? So, what have you got planned for the rest of the day? Anything good? Kenneth, what an insensitive question. Well, I was only asking. The police said something about meeting up with the British consulate, but I can't face that today. I'm absolutely drained. I just want to spend some time on my own. Gather my thoughts. Let it all sink in. You know, quiet. Peaceful reflection. Okay. Go! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god. What the bloody hell's going on there? Oh, that's them young Spanish.